Hello, my name is Jonathan Jolly, and this is my presentation on King Mark, an unloved protagonist. The role of King Mark in Tristan and Isolde has been largely overlooked, yet Wagner claimed that there were three main characters. While Mark receives little time on stage, his substantial Act Two monologue lends credence to Wagner's claim, but has also been criticised as being long and dull. In this presentation, I will analyse Wagner's dramaturgical portrait of Mark to evaluate his claim. With a study of Wagner's own comments on kingship, I shall examine Mark's place within the drama and the music of his Act Two lament. I wish to answer why Mark is frequently overlooked and whether this is appropriate. For context, I shall summarise the plot of the drama. Tristan and Courvenal have taken Princess Isolde from Ireland on the orders of Tristan's uncle and friend, King Mark, and are sailing back to Cornwall. Tristan had previously slain Isolde's fiancé, Marolt, following which Isolde tended to the injured Tristan, initially unaware of his identity. Isolde reminds him that he was allowed to leave her with the promise never to return. Isolde insists, therefore, that he drink atonement to her, a drink laced with poison. Tristan knows that this may be the case, but drinks it with her nonetheless. However, they fall madly in love with each other. Brangena has switched the death potion for a love potion. After Isolde's wedding to Mark, she and Tristan meet in secret while Mark is on a nighttime hunting trip. They declare their love, however, at dawn they are discovered by Mark, led by his servant Melot. Mark's monologue then confronts this betrayal. He is desperate for an explanation. Tristan cannot answer Mark's questions and accuses Melot of loving Isolde too. He and Melot raise their swords and Tristan is wounded. Act 3 begins with Tristan in seeking refuge in Cariol. When he sees that Isolde is approaching, he rips away his bandages in delirium and dies at her feet. Mark then arrives with company and violence ensues, instigated by Courvenal. Mark and Brangena reach Isolde and Mark declares that, having learned about the love potion, he forgives them entirely. Isolde describes a vision of Tristan risen and dies herself. Mark blesses their bodies, now alone. While there are two title characters, Wagner claimed in letters to Karl Eckert and Franz Betz in October 1875 that Mark was also a main character. This is certainly not reflected in the meagre amount of time that Mark receives on stage, yet might be reflected in the influence he has on events. Roger Scruton writes that Mark belongs to a Wagnerian archetype, that of the authority figure, guardian of the social order. This gains autobiographical significance when we consider Wagner's friendship with King Ludwig II of Bavaria, his benefactor. For Wagner saw himself in the character of Mark, as his wife Cosima documents in her diaries. R says to me, you married Mark, with the difference that in this case Mark was the nephew. This implies that the king had personal significance to Wagner, which warrants a re-evaluation of Mark. The question of Mark's significance has been debated since 1882, when the critic Edward Hanslick responded to Moritz Witt's paper on King Mark. Witt argued that Mark is by no means a secondary character in Wagner's drama, rather in a certain sense, the central figure. Hanslick disagreed, claiming that this old king plays a rather sorry minor part, indeed a tragicomic one. But which of these men are correct in their evaluation of Mark? To evaluate the king's role within the drama, we first need to understand Wagner's views on kingship. In On State and Religion, which Wagner wrote in 1864, commissioned by Ludwig II, Wagner explains such views on kingship. He writes that, in the person of the king, the state attains its true ideal. So the king is to embody the virtue of the state, which its citizens ought to emulate. The king should enable the aspiration of the people, providing stability for them to flourish. He wrote that the law which contains with all the strongest warrant of stability must therefore be the most perfect law of the state. Mark embodies such stability, as is shown by the devotion of Tristan and also Brangena's praise. Of noble blood and gentle disposition, who can compare with the man in power and glory? Before this, Isolde calls Mark Cornwall's feeble king, which implies his weakness. However, this is likely just an emotional attack from Isolde. One sign of Mark's virtue is to be found in his refusal to consummate his marriage to Isolde. He tells us, She whom I could never dare approach, she for whom I forswore my desires in bashful reverence. In his aforementioned essay, Wagner speaks of the personal sacrifice of private freedom required of a ruler. Mark tells Tristan explicitly, 
When childless, his wife died. He loved you so much that never again did Mark intend to wed. We can infer from this that Mark wanted Tristan to be his heir and saw no benefit to marriage, despite how happy it might make him personally. We can speculate that he would have been robbing Cornwall of a capable king should he remarry and have a son. Thus, his sense of duty and sacrifice is apparent. This honourable reading is reinforced by his gracious forgiveness of Tristan and Isolde. Arnold Whittle writes that it is the responsibility of kings not only to be realistic but to be lonely, and Wagner seems to have seen it as his responsibility to romanticise that loneliness. Mark dramatically fulfils this responsibility with grace, and at the end of Act 3 he is left utterly alone, standing over the bodies of those close to him. He bears the burden of kingship, a higher form of suffering which the king alone can personally experience on his own, as Wagner argued. Mark therefore serves dramatically as a reminder of the chivalric moral standard which Tristan and Isolde reject in favour of their love, while also being the only thing standing in the way of their happiness. This is his dramatic purpose, and it is for this reason that Cosima Wagner described him as that symbol of moral order and consequently herald of death. The ideal of the state serves as a judge of its subjects. At this point, it seems proper to introduce Wagner's appreciation for Schopenhauer, whose philosophical ideas have unquestionably influenced Tristan and Isolde deeply. The key idea for us to grasp here is the concept of the will, which Schopenhauer characterises as a blind, striving force, which conventionally drives our actions. Schopenhauer believed that suffering was ultimately caused by serving the will, and we must therefore seek liberation from it. In Act 2, the will is represented by the day, a time when Tristan and Isolde are unable to freely unite. Carol Berger writes that, dramatically, the main point of Mark's monologue is to allow Day's main representative to make the strongest possible case for it, and thus to allow Tristan to reject this case publicly. Eric Schaefer also writes that Mark is the embodiment of many of the key issues of Schopenhauer's philosophy. Despite doing nothing technically wrong, Mark functions as a villain, who challenges the happiness of Tristan and Isolde with the supposedly false values of the day. While Wagner agreed with Schopenhauer, he presents a steel man, common sense argument for the will by using the sympathetic Mark as a mouthpiece for it. It is important here to note that Wagner's portrait of Mark is far more likeable than his counterpart in Gottfried von Strasbourg's tale, Wagner's source material. In the medieval legend, the king is not tyrannical, but weak-willed and hedonistic. Strasbourg compares Mark to the timidest woman and remarks that he was self-absorbed at the expense of his own political interest about which he does not seem to care. Mark even fails to notice when his older sends Brangena in her stead on their wedding night. To him, one woman was as another. His lack of prudence and temperance are apparent, and Wagner saw fit to change these characteristics. Roger Scruton astutely concludes, Mark is not the sturdy, lascivious overlord of Gottfried's tale, but a saintly, simple figure acting for the good of his people. Mark is multifaceted in Wagner's drama, providing a legitimate moral dilemma to Tristan. This is admirable, given that Wagner could have created a genuine villain in remaining true to Strasbourg. This added depth makes the character of Mark more complex than Strasbourg's interpretation and supports Wagner's claim that he is a main character, rather than a mere plot device. Despite this, audiences have historically failed to sympathise with Mark. Reviewing a Munich performance in 1865, Otto Beard commented on the Act Two monologue, Painful was the effect of the preachy lecture, which seemed as though it would never end. This review is not unique. Scholars such as Carol Berger have reasoned that we have little patience for Mark's common decency and sense of honour after the enrapturing music of the Act II love duet. While I would agree with Cosmo Wagner that, as the judgmental herald of death, Mark is unlikely to be appreciated by audiences in support of Tristan and Isolde's unrestrained love, the music is also to blame for Mark's inability to evoke empathy from the audience. His monologue, after catching the two lovers in the act, stands out from much of the opera's music as being noticeably traditional in its construction. Julianne Heichel has identified a ternary structure in the monologue, three literary sections which display distinct formal traits of the lament in Greek tragedy, traditionally sung by a distressed female character. As an insatiable reader, Wagner would have been familiar with this idea. Most of the drama is through composed. However, this monologue bears striking similarity to an aria in ternary form. 
While Wagner criticized the operatic aria as nothing but a mutilated folk tune in artwork of the future, this may have been intended to portray Mark as outdated, reflecting his outlook. While speculative, this may have been the effect on contemporary listeners. The monologue begins with the descending unaccompanied motif in the bass clarinet. This is his lamenting motif, which denotes his grief. The descending notes are reminiscent of the falling tetrachord so often used to denote grief in 17th century opera, such as Dido's Lament in Purcell's Dido and Aeneas. The bass clarinet then follows Mark's melodic line, imitating him in bar 70 and then in bar 74, following his statement of the lamenting motif. Similarly, we hear the consternation motif, which Arnold Whittle calls the Mark motif, in bar 120, also from the bass clarinet. This represents Mark's shock at Tristan's disloyalty, and it is cleverly an inversion of Tristan's honour motif. These motifs of lament and consternation, which sigh with longing, give us some insight into the profundity of Mark's suffering. For example, bar 177, where the cor anglais sustains an E which blooms into the consternation motif as Mark expresses how he should not have let Tristan convince him to take his older as a wife. The monologue begins with very dark and sparse orchestration, starting with the bass clarinet, as mentioned. Mark's initial appeal is accompanied by the violas and cello. The violins are notably absent, this might denote wisdom and maturity, however this is only speculative. Regardless, it was not applauded by audiences. One critic wrote in 1874 that Mark was accompanied by a bassoon, or whatever instrument is lower than that. If one were to take the lowest note on the keyboard and then run two octaves down the legs of the piano, it might give some idea of it. While Mark's music is all nuanced and intelligently written, the noticeably sparse and dark orchestration provides immediate and perhaps unwanted contrast with the ecstasy of the preceding love duet. The low orchestration also emphasises the dark timbre of Mark's baritone voice, a shocking contrast to the high voices of Tristan and Isolde, to which the audience has become accustomed in Act Two. The archaic form and general lack of energy throughout the lament are similarly wearisome. Despite the negative reception of Mark, he plays a vital role as proponent for honour and chivalry, a virtuous philosophy that is repugnant to Tristan's Schopenhauerian worldview. Yet, he also embodies royal virtues which Wagner dutifully respects in his libretto. While he presents a recent response to Tristan and Isolde's adultery, the audience has already sided with the star-crossed lovers while he was absent for the first half of the opera, and the uninspiring music does nothing to convince us otherwise. While I agree with Moritz Wirth's claim of Mark's centrality to the drama, his music does not live up to his complexity and emotional significance. Therefore, more attention must be given to him dramatically in order to do the character justice. 